Good afternoon, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, to our second international webinar on food digestion, the InfoGest uh, webinar. Um, welcome from Rainy Island, mind you, but it shouldn't concern you because you're all online. Um, I would like to introduce the panelists, the other panelists. Um, they will show themselves in a minute. So first of all, uh, is Mern Egan, my colleague, he, colleague here from uh, uh, Chagas Moor Park, from the Food Research Center in Chagas Moor Park here in Ireland. She's our communication uh, specialist. Uh, we have uh, uh, Lottie Egger from Switzerland, from um, Isidra Rizio from Madrid and Alan Mackey from Leeds. So, so welcome, welcome. Uh, after our first uh, webinar, which was quite successful, we had 320 live attendants and subsequently we put it onto uh, uh, YouTube and we will do uh, the same uh, today. So we record this, this webinar and we put it up on YouTube. We have another 600 views there and really from around the world, not just from uh, Europe and North and South America, but also from overseas as far as Japan, Korea and uh, Australia, New Zealand, who uh, will not be present live right now. Hence, we put it on, on YouTube. So at the last um, webinar, we also noticed we had a lot of attendance um, uh, who are not working in the area of food digestion. Hence, we decided to uh, give you a, a good introduction to the area of food digestion and the simulated digestion. So we introduced the uh, static in vitro uh, digestion, the infogest method. And uh, without any delay, we start with a first presentation, an overview of food digestion by uh, Professor Alamaki from the University of Leeds. My name's Alan Mackey, and I'm going to give an overview of the mechanisms of food digestion. We will talk about the physiology. I'll say something about the geography of digestion and the biochemical environment, the timing of digestion, residence time in the different phases, and the control of digestion, how sensing and feedback control the movement of chyme or partly digested food from one phase of digestion to the next. I'll also say, say something about specific mechanisms around the digestion of insoluble compounds, and by that I largely mean lipids, and also the role of the food matrix, although this is quite a short talk, so we won't have time to go into lots of detail. Let's talk about the digestion and the geography of digestion. So it's well known that you could argue that digestion starts ahead of when we actually start eating the food. So Pavlov did experiments in dogs that showed that you could uh, induce salivation uh, through training. And similarly, if we think about food, we can start to salivate and other secretions are also increased. So in some senses, we start to have um, prepare for digestion ahead of anything actually entering our mouths. And we know that cognitive and sensory enhancement of satiety and enzyme secretion um, are important. However, most of us, I think, consider that digestion starts with oral processing. And this is where aroma, taste and texture sensing occur um, and starch hydrolysis um, and, of course, chewing, which is what releases the aroma and the, ta and the taste and give us that texture sensing. And this is also the point at which we make a decision about whether food is good to eat or whether it's potentially dangerous because it can be rejected at this point once swallowed Clearly, that option is, uh, is no longer there. From oral processing, we go into the stomach. So food is swallowed down the esophagus and enters the stomach where proteolysis and lipolysis occur. The food is acidified and it's a storage area as well, which is linked to our feeling of fullness. And it's stored before it is exposed to a certain amount of shearing and grinding 
and then pass into the intestinal phase of digestion, initially the small intestine, where proteolysis, lipolysis and amylolysis take place in a mixed environment, so that it is a well mixed system, and of course it's the main site of absorption of nutrients. Intestinal processing also involves nutrient sensing, hormone secretion as a result of the nutrient sensing, and this is what drives the feedback mechanisms, controlling things like gastrointestinal motility, enzyme and bile secretion, and also linking to appetite. And all of this to make sure that we optimally extract the nutrients from the food that we eat. In these images um, from MRI, you can see uh, bright regions are high in water and darker regions are low in water. So regions such as the stomach where you can see the esophagus empties into are shown bright and regions below that have a mixture of darker regions depending on the water content. And you can also see black regions uh, which represent areas that are filled with gas um, as a result of fermentation. So here again, taking a different slice, you can see the stomach and here you can also see the transverse colon. Fermentation uh, and removal of water takes place in the colon leading to the production of short chain fatty acids and gas, hence the dark regions. Let's start with oral processing. So oral, oral processing in relation to digestion involves chewing, mixing with saliva, forming a bolus and then swallowing. Chewing will break down the food until it forms a soft paste that can be swallowed. Of course, if it already comes in the form of a soft paste, we can swallow directly. But the important for more solid foods is to form that cohesive bolus. And as part of that process and as part of the lubrication that makes sure that food safely passes down into the stomach, we secrete saliva, which is essentially water, it's 95% water with electrolytes and proteins. Many of these proteins are surface active um, and there's also a certain amount of mucin present that helps create that cohesive slippery bolus that can be swallowed. The oral pH will mostly be governed by the food that we've consumed, but the pH of the saliva itself is around neutral, so something like 6.7 to 7.3. Um, and the enzyme present in saliva is alpha amylase, but not lingual lipase, unless you happen to be a rodent, of course. So in humans, we don't have lingual lipase, um, and any activity you see is likely to be uh, a result of um, bacterial enzymes. The residence time depends, obviously, on the food and does not have a single value, even for an individual. But for liquids, it's a few seconds and for more solid foods, it's going to be tens of seconds. And this is also affected by dentition. Um, not in the case of the uh, uh, young lady shown here, of course, but uh, in certainly in the case of the elderly, it can have a significant impact. And we also know that the length of time we spend chewing food can have an impact on appetite. So from the mouth, Food is formed into a bolus, it's swallowed, passes down the esophagus into the stomach for gastric processing. Gastric processing involves acidification, it involves hydrolysis, and a limited amount of mixing, most of which occurs um, close to the exit of the stomach in the antrum. And emptying is controlled uh, so that uh, the stomach is essentially a storage device. Acidification occurs through the secretion of hydrochloric acid, leading to a gradual decrease in the average pH, so that by the time the food is emptied from the stomach, so the fastest state, the pH is below two. There may also be local pH gradients, depending on the nature of the food that's being consumed. Enzymatic hydrolysis is driven by three enzymes that vary in their pH optimum. These enzymes um, obviously have um, different effects on different nutrients. 
so that as the gastric chyme gradually acidifies, different enzymes become more significantly active. So initially, um, as the pH of the food is likely to be relatively high, salivary amylase with an optimum of 6.8 digests the starch. Of course, it remains active until the pH drops to something like four. So in that window of pH, it's quite active. The next enzyme is gastric lipase, and this has an optimum of pH 5.3, so it digests the lipids. And then finally, the pepsin with an optimum of pH 2 digests the proteins. So as the uh, contents of the stomach gradually acidifies, initially we have a lot of uh, starch hydrolysis, then we have lipid hydrolysis, and finally we have the protein hydrolysis um, as the pH drops uh, over time, of course. A mixing occurs mostly in the antrum and through the pylorus. The residence time depends on the type of food and is essentially influenced by two different factors. It's influenced by the caloric density. So the more calorie dense something is, uh, the more slowly it empties. Uh, and we could think about a rough average of something like two kilocalories a minute. And also the structure of the food in the stomach, so the structure of that chyme has an impact. So the more liquid the chyme, the faster it will empty from the stomach. This means that more solid foods empty more slowly, of course. As an example, here is uh, results from a study that we did a while ago where we used um, the same calorie load, but with different calorie densities. And you can see that the, um, the caloric emptying rate was roughly the same in both cases. So in this case, around about two kilocalories a minute. But clearly the rate of food emptying uh, was very different. So the calorie dense food, which in this case is labeled uh, REF, was emptied more slowly than the uh, low calorie density food. And this obviously also has an impact then on appetite. So the fullness and hunger ratings related to that were also um, different, as you might expect. So from the stomach, food moves into the small intestine for processing. The geography is that it passes into the duodenum. It then passes into the jejunum and the ileum. Pancreatic secretions and bile are added in the duodenum. The pH and the enzyme activities are in flux, but the pH broadly is brought up to close to neutral again. Uh, there is good physical processing, i.e. it is a well-mixed system, and it's the site of absorption. So we neutralize the acid, we add surfactants, we have hydrolysis of the major nutrients, we have a well-mixed system, and we have absorption. Uh, and we have control of that process and how the nutrients move along the GI tract. So gastric chyme pH is neutralized by the addition of base and then enzymatic hydrolysis is driven essentially by three groups of enzymes. So pancreatic amylase digests starch to maltose and dextrins. Pancreatic proteases like trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, etc digest the proteins to peptides and pancreatic lipases such as lipase, phospholipase A2, lysophospholipase, etc. Um, then digest the, the lipid systems into largely free fatty acids, um, but obviously it depends on, uh, on the nature of the lipase that we're talking about. Intestinal chyme is well mixed in segments, meaning that absorption doesn't rely on diffusion. Uh, if you do some calculations, looking at that, you'll realise diffusion coefficients are way too slow and we'd all starve to death if that was the case. So it's a well-mixed system um, and we only rely then on diffusion through the unstirred water layer, which I'll say a bit about uh, shortly. The intestinal epithelium has a large surface area and absorptive cells called enterocytes have a brush border and associated with that brush border are enzymes that generate the final stages of digestion, if you like, to the nutrients that are actually absorbed. So um, in the case of starch, the maltose is converted to glucose um, and there are um, endopeptidases that um, 
will um, produce amino acids or small peptides, two to three uh, amino acid peptides for absorption. Of course, that's not saying there aren't larger peptides that are absorbed, but the main role is to make sure that proteins are broken down to really small peptides for absorption. The chyme will take several hours to travel down to the ileocecal valve, um, and there will be a significant flux of water, not just out, but also in, depending on osmotic pressure. Uh, and there's plenty of work showing that there's really significant flux of water, both in and out of the intestine as your uh, chyme travels down the uh, GI tract. This is what the um, gut looks like. This is uh, a pig intestine, pig small intestine, and you can see, I hope, that it's covered in this protective mucus layer. The, uh, the mucus layer you can see here uh, around the tip of a villus. So um, in this image, the uh, mucus is stained green and you can see the goblet cells standing out clearly and the DNA in the cells is stained red. And you can see that there's lots of red in the mucus layer, which has partly detached during the fixing process. Um, and this is because um, cells travel from the crypt to the tip of the villus over something like three to five days, and then they're shed from the, uh, the top of this uh, villus. And they end up trapped in the mucus layer. And as the DNA um, degrades, uh, actually it provides a lot of the barrier properties within that layer. So it's that mucus and DNA layer that um, the nutrients have to diffuse through in order to get to the enterocytes underneath for absorption. From the small intestine, what you haven't absorbed passes into the large intestine for uh, colonic processing, and that's largely about fermentation of things like dietary fiber, phenolics, and other compounds and also water recovery. So gut microbiota ferment anything not absorbed from the food by the small intestine. This includes polysaccharides, uh, smaller oligosaccharides, polyols, phenolic compounds, a whole range of other uh, components. And the products of fermentation obviously are varied but primarily they're things like short chain fatty acids, so propionate, butyrate, etc. Uh, and also gases, so things like methane, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, etc., uh, and other metabolites, for example, from phenolic compounds. Also, water is removed from the intestinal content before it's passed to the rectum. So control and feedback. I said that there was um, a role to play in tasting all the way down the GI tract, and um, the sensing of neutral nutrients, uh, responding to chyme and, and controlling that flow and secretion of enzymes is really key to making sure that digestion is as efficient as possible. So digestion is controlled by G protein coupled receptors. Um, these uh, vary widely. Uh, we have a lot of them. So even in the mouth, taste is uh, governed not by the five, by five different taste receptors, as you might expect, but by a whole range of different receptors, depending on the taste we're talking about. And this is also true as we go down the GI tract. There are a number of different receptors that are um, in different concentrations, in different locations, so uh, and that respond to different nutrients. So the digestion is quite carefully controlled throughout the GI tract. Um, and these receptors can detect certain ligands and generate cellular responses um, and the secretion of GI tract hormones. There are something like 20 different GI hormones with a range of different functions. And although they're not all fully understood, some examples are things like ghrelin that increase gastric emptying and stimulate appetite, cholecystokinin, better known as CCK, um, that stimulates secretion of bile and pancreatic enzymes and also has an influence on gastric emptying. GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide 1 that stimulates insulin secretion and inhibits gastrointestinal motility and is also linked to appetite. 
and glucose dependent insulinotropic peptide, uh, more conveniently known as GIP, that stimulates insulin secretion. An example um, here is um, some data shown from a study that we did where we fed either oat flakes or oat flour. So essentially the same meal, but the structure was different and we were looking to see whether this had an influence on the digestion. So initially we looked at plasma glucose and you can see that there was no difference between the two groups. And indeed the amount of uh, glucose that we saw as a peak after the meal was relatively small. And this is because glucose Blood glucose is really tightly controlled and it's tightly controlled at least partly through insulin. And when we looked at the insulin, we did see differences uh, in the uh, secretion peak. And if we then looked, when we then looked at GIP, we saw there was a really significant difference. So the GIP is perhaps a more direct link to what is happening in the small intestine and this controls the amount of insulin that's being secreted in response to the glucose arriving in the bloodstream. And this compensates for any differences, which means that the actual differences that you see in the bloodstream are relatively small. So uh, I think this also highlights that it's not always easy to see um, what is going on through digestion by measuring something in the I said I'd say something about lipid digestion, just really to say that it's complicated because all of the components are insoluble. Here we see that a lipid droplet is surrounded by bile salts with co-lipase anchored to the surface and to that is linked pancreatic lipase and that then generates mixed micelles. Um, that sounds very simple, but if we look in uh, detail at the kind of thing that you see, uh, you see a real range of different structures present and it's very hard to be sure what kind of structures are really going to be formed uh, and what will be uh, carried through to the site of absorption. So different structures uh, are formed depending on the, uh, on the type of it. In terms of the food matrix, the digestion of food uh, is uh, efficient, but we still know that not all nutrients are absorbable. So proximate analysis of a food may not represent the nutritional value of the food. We know that the gastric phase is really a, a, a phase where um, food is stored prior to being um, thoroughly digested in the small intestine. And in that changing environment where the food is held for some time, uh, it can generate phase separation or aggregation that can then alter the digestion kinetics. We know that cellular encapsulation will limit the extent of digestion. So when we chew, we don't break open every single plant cell uh, as we consume it. Uh, and if it's not broke broken open, often the nutrients are not released. Dietary fiber can also uh, alter the passage of chyme through the GI tract. And we know that the rate of absorption uh, can affect plasma concentrations and thus potential bioactivity. Conclusion, digestion is a complex process that has evolved to efficiently extract nutrients from minimally processed food. Of course, that's not what we're consuming now, but that's what we've evolved to do. Digestion consists of four dynamic phases. Chewing and sensing, as I, as I said, that is the phase where we determine whether it's safe to eat or not. Storage, partial sterilization, and the gradual release of digestion in the gastric phase, then hydrolysis and absorption in the small intestine, and finally fermentation and absorption of fermentation products in the large intestine. And we know that digestion kinetics is important for the reasons that I've just illustrated. I hope this has been useful. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Excellent, Alan. Thank you for for your talk. Um, the talks were pre-recorded and just to be on conservative side. So, uh, Alan, it's not the first time uh, Alan has seen his own talk. And, uh, <laughs> it can be kind of painful. Anyway, um, we have a number of questions. Um, and Alan, you answered some of them. I might still read read them 
out to you because not everybody saw the answer. The first question came from, um, there you go, there, give me a second, uh, Charlotte uh, Olivier. How is the hung hunger measured? Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, certainly. Um, the short answer was we asked questions uh, like, how hungry are you? But in order to get it, and that in terms of a number, we used what's called a visual analog scale, where you have uh, a line with not hungry at all at one end and extremely hungry at the other end. And then we ask the participant to make a mark on that line that indicates their level of hunger. This is then measured and turned into a number. Very good. Yeah, thank you, Alan. There, there are plenty of questions. You can see that it's difficult to make a choice, but there is one about if there is a reference for humans um, proving that uh, we don't produce lingual lipase. I don't have one immediately to hand, but certainly there are a few papers by Frederick Carrier that have indicated that, and they've done really a lot of work on lipase and has never seen any activity in, uh, in the oral cavity for a human lipase. So the, another question is how enzymes work as their optimum pH is a different one for each? Um, just because enzymes have an optimum pH doesn't mean that they don't work outside of that pH. Um, but as I indicated, there's a window uh, of useful activity. And actually, um, even at pH 7, pepsin has really small amounts of activity. Um, so um, I'm always surprised by that, but there is some measurable activity at high pH. So you can be quite a long way from the optimum when the uh, the enzyme is still generating some activity so it's still um, acting as a catalyst very good i have one or two more questions one uh, one short one is there a clear different differentiation between the duodenum jejunum and ileum um there are a number of differences between them. Um, so for example, in the duodenum, the villi are longer. So the available surface area per length of gut is much higher and they get shorter as you progress towards the ileum. Um, there are um, expression of different um, uh, um, channel transporters. Uh, for example, um, bile is largely recycled in the ileum, so it's secreted into the duodenum uh, and then passes down the duodenum and the jejunum to the ileum, where something like 95% of it is reabsorbed uh, with only a small proportion passing into the colon. And there are a number of other changes, particularly in terms of those G protein coupled receptors that I talked about. Um, that are linked to different um, GI tract hormones. Maybe one more, Isidra. Okay, uh, we have a question regarding the differences, for instance, in digestion between homogenized and non-homogenized uh, whole milk. Do you think that there is a difference on digestion? Uh, yes, the processing has a big role to play in the way that milk is digested. Um, and indeed, Andre and I uh, collaborated on some work with a PhD student that shows exactly this. So if you have a look in the literature for that article, it will show you that there are significant differences depending on how the milk is processed. Um, although the biggest difference is between raw milk and processed milk, there are differences depending on how you process it subsequently. Okay, so in the interest of time, we might continue. Um, uh, all questions will be answered. So during the next talk, we can uh, answer them in, in writing. And if you don't answer the question during the webinar, we will contact you personally. Or if you have any other question, uh, you can uh, ask the question on the YouTube channel and some, some of us uh, will, will answer it. So uh, I was uh, asked to present the next talk on the InfoGest method. So Mern, if you might share your screen, please. So Alan Mackey gave a nice overview of the um, mechanism of 
food digestion and the interplay between food and the uh, digestion product of food and the physiolo physiology of the uh, host. The next talk is about how to simulate this food digestion. And there are dynamic and static in vitro digestion models, and I'm starting with a dynamic, just to mention them, and dynamic uh, digestion models are basically models uh, where the pH varies, the concentration of the enzyme and uh, the systems or the models, they simulate the removal of the bolus. And here are some uh, of the more well-known uh, models. On the left-hand side, you see the TIM-1 model. Uh, it's an older model that has been approved since, but you, no you nicely see the stomach compartment here on the top and three intestinal compartments, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Um, and on the right hand side, you see uh, an image of the uh, model gut developed in IFR in the UK. And there are a number of dynamic uh, digestion models scattered around the world in France, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Spain, and Israel. And recently, we have an addition from uh, China. Here, they 3D printed a stomach, a kind of a rubber stomach that is similar to uh, um, the model in New Zealand. Um, all of these are pretty good uh, representations of the real in vivo digestion. However, there are some shortcomings. And one of them is obviously that you can only run one or two samples per day. Um, some of them are commercial and some of them are semi-commercial, hence the digestion parameters uh, are proprietary and they are not standardized. And last but not least, they tend to be expensive, not just uh, the cost of the instruments, but also the running costs of the instruments. So out of that need for easy digestion models, uh, people come up with a simple one-pot models. One pot means that you have the oral, gastric, and intestinal phase in, in one reaction vessel. And the uh, um, pH is generally constant within one phase, the ionic strength, the concentration of enzymes, and the ratio of food to electrolyte doesn't change during the uh, digestion phase. So a number of years ago, the group of Julian McClemens uh, reviewed the area. And here on the right hand side, you see tables upon tables of examples of studies. Uh, they reviewed 80 studies um, with a great variety of digestion parameters, uh, with the result that in reality, you cannot compare the results of these digestion uh, methods. So out of that need, the good people of INRA and IFR at the time, Didier Dupont and Alain Mackey, they started a EU-funded cost action. Uh, it is a network with several hundred members and myself and Isidra Retio, looking 10 years younger down here. We volunteered to lead a working group where, with the aim of harmonizing these in vitro digestion method. And it took a long time, it took over three years um, to come up with a compromise rather than a consensus. It was a very slow process and this resulted in our first high impact publication. That is the uh, Minicos 2014 paper in food and function where we um, define the digestion parameters, the oral phase, the gastric phase, and the intestinal phase. Um, it is an open access uh, paper based on available physiological data, or that was available at the time. And since then, that really has been the academic and industry standard for simulating uh, the digestion of food in vitro, at least as a standard uh, static method. Subsequently, um, last year, we published a follow-on paper, uh, a very detailed um, protocol of the digestion method. It also addressed some of the ambiguities in the original methods. 
uh, and it has a list of materials, uh, critical steps, um, and we included a very detailed material methods uh, section, including what kind of um, enzymes are required in the order numbers. So here's a, a really detailed step-by-step -step protocol. In this case, this is step number 25. You have to pre-warm the electrolyte. Step number 26, you change the pH and so forth. So now I will guide you step-by-step -step through the InfoJS protocol. The first one is the uh, uh, preparation uh, of the digestion procedure, and that might take a couple of days. So you prepare your electrolytes. You have to perform enzyme assays, or at least we strongly recommend not to rely on the information by the supplier, but test or assay your enzymes yourself in the supporting uh, information of the paper. We outline step-by-step -step protocols of all the um, different enzymes, the amylase, the peps, pepsin, the lipase, and so forth. Um, that might take a number of days, but it's well worth it uh, and it improves, uh, makes it more accurate uh, and improves the um, accuracy and the precision of your um, digestion protocol and make sure that you can compare it with the literature compared with other groups. And we have provided uh, very nice Excel spreadsheets, again, in the supporting uh, information and uh, YouTube videos of the individual enzyme assays. So the second uh, phase is the digestion itself. And the first question, of course, you have to ask yourself, what is the research question? What is the endpoint? What are you looking for? Uh, is static digestion the right method? So uh, the static digestion, they are pretty good for estimating the endpoint of the gastric and the intestinal phase. They are probably not so good for uh, estimating the kinetics. We'll give you an idea, but it's not an accurate uh, uh, a good description of the kinetics of the di digestion methods. We also have a section um, on uh, some consideration of the food, food as a meal or part of the meal. For instance, if you're interested in the uh, gastrointestinal digestion of oils or fats, you have to put it into a form um, uh, how you actually consume it in a food. So uh, it is rare that you uh, consume a meal of oil or fat. It is usually in emulsified form, uh, part of a meal. Uh, another example is flour. Uh, you never eat flour, but you have to transform it into something that is edible, uh, bread or pasta or whatever it is. Um, and here's another example of cheese. Uh, if you are interested in digestion of cheese, uh, cheese is not a meal, but it's usually part of the meal, unless you live in Switzerland and have a have a, a cheese fondue, which is fine, but it's not a, a common meal, let's say that, not a daily meal. So in this case, uh, you probably have to dilute it, and we give uh, one or two examples that is that was based on um, in vivo results. Another point is uh, the design of the study. So we recommend one test tube per time point. So for example, if you choose to have uh, five time points in the gastric phase, time 0, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes, that means you have five test tubes. So one test tube per time point. And last but not least, I put it on, on to this slide. If you're working with digestive enzymes, ice, ice, ice. So you have to uh, put the enzyme on ice because um, uh, otherwise you deactivate um, the enzyme or loses activity. So the first step is the oral phase. Uh, we recommend to, to always include the oral phase. If you have solid food, you should use a mincer, such as one of those, electric or hand mincer uh, for solid food. If the food contains starch and you are interested in the digestion of starch, then you have to include salivary amylase and the exposure of the amylase should be uh, two minutes at pH seven, 
37 degrees. The second digestive phase is the gastric phase where you take the oral bolus from the oral phase and dilute it one-to-one -one with a simulated gastric fluid which contains pepsin at an activity of 2000 units per milliliter in the final digestion mixture or so in the final mixture that contains the um, oral bolus and everything that is in the simulate gastric fluid. You also add gastric lipase, and that's a recent uh, addition to the InfoGest method. And we recommend rapid gastric lipase, which at the moment is the um, best uh, um, option to represent human gastric lipase at the pH 3, with it, which is the pH of the which is the average pH of the gastric phase. That's a common question that we are asked, why did we choose pH 3 rather than pH 1 or 2? Um, simply because food is not exposed to the um, fasting pH of 1 or 2 for very long. Um, it starts at a higher pH and the physiological response to the food is addition of HDL. Uh, of gastric acid. Uh, so the pH 3 is a compromise and the average pH during the gastric phase. And of course the gastric phase needs to be properly mixed. So here's an example of a some kind of windmill mixture. So my colleague Daniela Freit has just taken out one tube, one time point. Um, so you can use uh, any type of you know proper uh, mixer that fits into a, uh, an incubator so you can run the gastric phase at 37 degrees. The intestinal phase. Uh, again, we take the gastric chyme and mix it one to one with the uh, electrolyte or with the simulated uh, intestinal fluid. Um, we recommend pancreatin, so that's the uh, enzyme cocktail and we base the amount of pancreatin on the activity of the trypsin, which we specify right over here. Um, if your um, interest is uh, in the digestion of lipids, you have to assay the lipase as well. And if necessary, you have to substitute uh, lipase. We also gave the option of individual enzymes, so the individual uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, and so forth. Uh, if you uh, if you uh, want to digest very pure components, and if you are interested in the mechanism, and of course you have to add the bile salt. Two hours at pH seven, and of course mixing of the digestion. The next step and that's the last step is very important it's just as important as the first two steps and that is sampling and sample uh, preservation and we uh, outline a whole table uh, table in the paper uh, we outline different scenarios so it really is case by case and depends on the analysis that you want to perform afterwards so um, in order to uh, preserve or stop the enzymatic action, you may have to heat it. So if you are interested in, um, I don't know, um, starch digestion or mineral uh, um, uh, mineral digestion, you know, heat might be a, a viable option. But if you look at um, proteins, heat denatures the proteins so that alters the uh, structure of the digester, you have to uh, you may have to increase the pH and bring it up to a pH 7 to inhibit uh, some of the pepsin, or you might use solvents or enzyme inhibitors. Snap freezing in liquid nitrogen is always a good idea because it immediately stops the um, digestion. And for sample uh, preservation, freeze drying might be a viable option. It also depends on if you want to uh, uh, do a follow-on experiment, so such as putting the digester on cell cultures or perform a fecal fermentation. So it's really a case-by-case, case and you have to consider it very, very carefully. 
So here are a number of tools that we um, gave you. Um, uh, Olivia Menard and Lottie Egger, they designed a very nice Excel spreadsheet. It outlines step by step what you have to start with and what kind of enzyme, how much enzyme you have to dissolve and so forth. And Rita Portman, he translate that Excel spreadsheet into an online, um, online spreadsheet. We also create a very nice YouTube video. So if you Google InfoGest in YouTube, you will get to uh, uh, the digestion procedures and here the enzyme assays. And I actually, you, you can also see the um, first InfoGest webinar. So after this webinar, uh, I will put the entire uh, webinar into this um, YouTube, ch YouTube channel. So what are the future perspectives? And I only have one slide here. Obviously, population groups. So the current InfoGest method is for adults only. And there's a uh, great interest in infant and older or elderly older adults uh, um, digestion methods. So here are two papers that nicely review um, these um, population groups, the digestion uh, procedures for these population groups. Uh, the next thing is probably the inclusion of brush border membrane enzymes. And we we were very close to include it, but there was no uh, consensus on it. And there was uh, uh, probably no consensus on, on what kind of activity we have to add here. Um, Lottie Egger is also working on um, ISO method, uh, in particular the digestibility of proteins and what is beyond the static digestion. Uh, last year, um, Annabelle Mole Cabero, uh, she uh, published a consensus method, a semi-dynamic consensus method, uh, which is based on the InfoGest method, and that might be a subject of a separate talk. And here, some final remarks. And in a way, I want to pre-empty some of the questions. The pros, what are the pros and cons of static, uh, static digestion? So the strength is definitely um, that, it, that it represents um, the endpoints of the gastric and intestinal phases, phases pretty well. And we have some very nice in vitro, in vivo comparison on the right-hand side, led by Lottie. Agar and Isida Rithio. It is a relatively easy method and is good for screening. Um, another question, common question is, do we include uh, bacteria or the microbiome in, in the method? And the answer is no, uh, at least not at the moment. Um, also, some of the individual parameters, I, I'm very often I'm asked about the pH of the gastric phase, why is pH 3? Uh, let me tell you that each of these parameters has been discussed at great, great length, and we can justify it as based on physiological data. If you um, divert from these, um, please, when you, when you publish it, please justify it properly, why you change uh, from these parameters. Um, another uh, question that comes up very often is the enzyme assays, you know, how important they are. And I mentioned that earlier on, they are crucial. They are just as important as the digestion uh, procedure. Uh, and we added a whole table of troubleshooting in the paper. So um, that is my last slide. Uh, I'd like to thank all the co-authors, in particular Isida Rethio and Lottie Egger, uh, the chief writing, writing team uh, of the paper, and we are ready to take questions.
Perfect. Well done, Andre. We have a number of uh, questions. I don't know where you would like to start, but um, one at the start is, um, is there a rule of thumb on how to mimic closely gastric emptying in different dairy products? Okay, I think you mentioned that earlier already. So um, a rule of thumb would be uh, two kilocalories per minute. However, in the static uh, digestion method, we don't empty. So that's why they are static. So the ratio of food to enzyme uh, uh, or to a digestive fluid uh, remains constant throughout uh, the gastric and intestinal phase. So if you want to simulate gastric emptying, you have to go to a dynamic or at least to semi-dynamic methods. And I mentioned early on, we have uh, published, we've recently published a consensus method or at least the first step for a semi-dynamic method. Okay. And there's a question from Anais Lavoisier. Um, why did you add the gastric lipase to this new version? I don't know if anybody wants to answer that. Nothing. I, I mean, it has an activity in the gastric phase. It's a physiological uh, enzyme. So it, we want to be close, as close as possible to physiology. So that's why uh, we uh, recommend to add it in this protocol. Okay, um, and uh, I think this one might also be for you. Um, so Ashkan Madadlu asks, is there any quantitative relationship between the concentration of the intestinal enzymes and the required concentration of the enzyme inhibitor PEFA block? Yeah, I guess uh, it's empirical. So we just uh, checked if the proteins were, the protein degradation was stopped at the, at the desired time point but no we don't have a molarity or so okay um somebody would like to know whether there are any protocols to simulate bariatric surgery i don't know if there are any um, but okay we can adapt this one to, to simulate bariatric surgery it depends what you want to do so to reduce the, the gastric phase or even avoid the gastric phase at all so we yeah. can adapt this one to, to, this, uh, to this case. Okay. Um, also, fr um, from somebody anonymous, from the 2014 um, Minicus um, et al. paper, enzyme concentrations uh, are specified, but the starting material is always different, i.e. the digesti digestion protein, so the substrate, uh, and the amount ranges um, from very few migs to several grams. So the volume of the reaction also changes. What do you think about setting an enzyme to protein ratio to improve the standardization of the result? Isidra, do you want to start and I can continue with that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with that. I think that we can standardize the enzyme substrate ratio but we thought that it is maybe more physiological if we simulate and we introduce a fixed amount of, of food and, and, and it was demonstrated between different labs. But at the end, there is a minimum and a maximum uh, that you can introduce, food that you can introduce in the system. So you cannot introduce as, as, food, as much food as, as you want. So there is always a limit. So if there is no a fixed uh, relation, enzyme substrate relationship, but I think that there are limits uh, within the model regarding the amount of food that you can enter in the system. Yeah, I might add to that. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and you're not the first one to answer that, uh, to, to ask that question. So we discussed this at length, really. And uh, uh, one suggestion that we came up with was um, to treat the food that you want to digest as a meal. Okay, so uh, uh, would you, uh, consume a couple of milligrams if you scaled it up as a meal, would that be a meal? Or would, you know, 100 or 200 grams of cheese, would that be a meal for you? So uh, consider it as a, as a meal, okay? But uh, it will be, would be very hard to, uh, to uh, find a ratio, you know, protein to, uh, to enzyme. I think it's a good idea, but we didn't find, you know, a, a feasible, easy to follow a solution for that. Okay. We ask um, also some. Uh, yeah, go on, Lottie. 
Yes. So what I mean, not everybody is interested in proteins, first of all. But if you are interested in proteins and you would like to compare different substrates, I would definitely recommend to adjust the uh, foods to the protein level and put them in, a, in at the same amount in the digestion. Okay. As you might do in a clinical study, in fact. Okay, so I might uh, interrupt you. Uh, it's two minutes to uh, three o'clock, and I would like to finish within time. Within time, I just have a couple of slides, just a few, a few announcements. Okay. I would like the panelists uh, uh, of presenting and answer answering the questions. So I will just share my screen here. Give me a second. Um, here we go. Can you see my screen? I hope you can. So the uh, uh, webinars uh, will be for the foreseeable future. We will have the webinars every on every first Wednesday of each month at two o'clock uh, standard Irish time. So Dublin, if you Google Dublin, that's the that's the time. Same time as today. The next webinar will be fourth of November. And uh, as far as I know, you can use the same login. Um, isn't that right, Moran? It's the same same login. Uh, uh, yes, it is. Excellent, excellent. So it is a again one hour, two speakers. Uh, afterwards, we publish uh, publish the talk on YouTube, um, covering you know uh, subjects of uh, the subject of food digestion, and the announcement will be. A, uh, via LinkedIn or emails. If you want to uh, receive emails uh, from the InfoGest uh, network, uh, please send an email to Nathalie Lamar or Didi Dupont, and you can find their uh, email address. If it's a bit too fast for you, just go to the website. Uh, I also uh, create a LinkedIn group, an InfoGest LinkedIn group, and in my own, and I have a Twitter account as well. Uh, at the moment, I seem to be the only user of the InfoGest group, so I invite you to, uh, to actually use it. So if you want to put uh, new papers on it, or if you, look, if you look for staff, you know, use it, you know, use it. At the moment, I'm, I'm the only one, and I shouldn't be the only one. Uh, just a, a word or two about the InfoGest network. We have several working groups, and uh, if you are interested in any of the working group or more than one, just uh, uh, tell Didier or Natalie that you want to be a part of that. So we have uh, working group one and uh, uh, in vitro uh, in vitro models. Uh, two is food and meal, food interaction, and meal digestion. Uh, the third one is uh, absorption models, and that will be the topic of the next webinar. Uh, we have the lipase and lipid group, uh, starch, and um, the in silico models. So the next uh, webinar will be uh, same time, Wednesday, 4th of November, um, by the working group uh, three, and that is led by uh, our own Dr. Linda Giblin here in the Chagas Food Research Center. Uh, and uh, the title is Food Digestion and the Gut Barrier. And at the moment, we are looking for a second speaker. And I think Linda sent out an email to the working group members. But if you think you have a good story to tell, let Linda know. Uh, and again, I'm aware that I'm, I have a bit of a monopoly here to, uh, to uh, advertise uh, uh, events. Um, this is a, our next event uh, that uh, we are organizing from here. Uh, the food structure and functionality uh, mini symposium, two and a half hours. We have some excellent speakers here: Julie McClemens, Milena Kordik, Anvesha, uh, our own Laura Gomez Mascarake, and the last speakers from California on in vitro meat. If you want me to advertise some of these events, you can do it yourself on LinkedIn or send me an email, and I'm happy to share this. So far, see you on the fourth of November. Goodbye and slán.